Uh, good afternoon. Welcome uh, to today's Grand Rounds. Uh, please remember to sign the attendance record and also please remember to fill out the uh, program evaluations and uh, give us any ideas that you might have in regards to future topics or future speakers. Um, I wanted to let you know that next week we uh, will not be having a Grand Rounds presentation. Um, today, uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce Dr. Julie Heimbach. Uh, Dr. Heimbach uh, is uh, currently Associate Professor of Surgery at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine, and she's the Surgical Director of the Liver Transplant Program. She did her uh, training at the University of uh, Minnesota, the University of Colorado, and then at Mayo. Uh, during training, she was recipient of multiple awards and honors, uh, and she also has been extensively published uh, both in uh, peer-reviewed journals and uh, textbooks, uh, and she kindly accepted our invitation today to drive down from Rochester and update us on obesity and liver transplantation. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Heimbach. Thank you very much, Dr. Heimbach, for your... I'm gonna put this over here, I think. Thanks very much, it's very uh, great to be here. Can you guys hear me okay? Perfect, good, excellent, good. So my uh, topic is actually, uh, I am a liver transplant surgeon, as you heard, so um, it's probably a little bit of a narrow focus, but Luckily, there's a lot uh, within the same topic that we can discuss, and I'm going to talk to you today about obesity um, and how it's impacting liver disease and liver transplant. So I, I thought it's always best to start with a case. Um, this is a, a case that was referred to us actually from another state in the Midwest, a 41-year-old gentleman who was previously well, except he did have a history of long-standing obesity. He developed subfulminant hepatic failure following a treatment uh, of seven-day course of Bactrim. When he was referred to us, he had a grade one to two encephalopathy. His MELD score, which I'll explain to you what that means in just a little bit, um, is 40. That was calculated from his labs that you can see there, INR of five, bilirubin of 30, and a creatinine of 0.8. Um, he really had no uh, concerning history. He was a stable uh, employment. He was married. He had excellent support. Um, and he was transferred primarily uh, from an outside transplant center, actually, who had declined to offer him transplant, primarily because his BMI was very high. It was 60. His height was 177 centimeter, and his weight was 188 kilograms. So this is a case we're going to come back to um, in terms of how we could approach this patient. So the objectives today, we're going to talk a little bit more about the scope of the obesity epidemic, which I think we're all well familiar with, but specifically review the impact that this is having on liver um, and also on liver transplant. Um, talking about a little bit about options for treatment. We'll talk about non-invasive weight loss, pre-transplant bariatric surgery, post-transplant bariatric surgery, and some conclusions. So this is information that we're all uh, probably too familiar with at this point. Um, the bad news is, of course, the prevalence of obesity in the United States uh, is very high, about 35% of adult U.S. males and uh, a similar percentage of U.S. females, 35.8%, are considered obese, meaning having a BMI greater than 30. For children and adolescents, it's nearly 17%, which is probably the most depressing part of that statistic. But on the good side, it does appear that the dramatic increases that we have been seeing in the incidence of obesity may be leveling off. So looking at U.S. men and women, the rate of obesity in 2009 to 2010 were actually similar to the previous six years. So you know this has been dramatically increasing. Perhaps now we're seeing that we're getting to the sort of leveling off. And also this is true in children. So this maybe is a little bit encouraging, but as you've seen these dramatic slides, you can see that this is really over a very short time from 1991 now to 2010. So just two decades where looking at the United States here with you know, roughly between 10 and 15 percent here in the Midwest, Minnesota, Iowa, exactly the same. This sort of blue color represents between 10 and 15 percent of the population considered to be obese with a BMI greater than 30. And then just, you know, as I said, two decades later, greater than 30 percent. So that's a very significant change over a very short time. And so what does that mean for the liver? So the impact of obesity on the incidence of NASH, NASH is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So uh, two-thirds of people who are obese have steatosis, and that's what you can see right here. This is a biopsy of the liver showing these little white blobs, which is fat within the liver. And that's about, you know, two-thirds of the people who are obese have just what we call bland steatosis, so fat in the liver that really doesn't cause any problems. 
Of these, two-thirds will just continue to have that bland steatosis, but one-third will progress to what's called steatohepatitis. So that's 30 million people in the United States with steatohepatitis. And that's what we can see here with this more activity. You know, whenever you see these blue dots, we start knowing that there's some activity going on. And of this group, roughly 5 to 15 percent will progress to cirrhosis, where you can see the bridging scar tissue in between here. So that's about 3 million people in the U.S. So right now, NAFLD, which is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which incorporates the whole spectrum of steatosis to steatohepatitis to cirrhosis, this is the most common liver disease in the United States today. And this is um, similarly represented in this data from Olmsted County, which is where Rochester, Minnesota is, um, looking at autopsy cases of people that died of non-natural causes of death, um, reviewed from the period of 1981 to 2010. So that's 465 cases that people that didn't die of a natural cause, they had to have a mandatory autopsy. You can see the age is very similar in all three cohorts, 37 percent male, also very similar, but you can see that the BMI just keeps going up, and the number that were actually considered obese, and the number that have fatty liver and who have NASH. So this is very representative of the data that I just showed you, also true in Rochester. So it's interesting to consider why do some people just have fatty liver and why doesn't everybody get NASH? And it's really important to know that from what we can tell so far um, with research into fatty liver disease, you need multiple injuries to occur before you get to the point of the scarring. Um, and you can see the steps here. This gets pretty technical, but for the most part, understanding that it's not just one thing that triggers this. Um, so fatty liver differential diagnosis and definitions. Um, again, while well, we just spoke about steatosis, which is just simply fatty infiltration of the liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, is, it's part of that spectrum. But when you get associated inflammation and fibrosis, then we start calling it NASH or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Okay, and the important thing is this non-alcoholic part, because if you consume alcohol and you're heavy, is it alcoholic liver disease or is it fatty liver disease? And it's really kind of a blurry line, really, but if you have less than 20 grams of alcohol per day, this is generally the accepted definition. So large droplet and small droplet fat is also important, so macrovesicular versus microvesicular. There's a number of um, things that do cause this sort of microvesicular injury, but it's completely not related to the thing we're talking about, which is basically either fatty liver disease or alcoholic liver disease, very similar. Small droplet is this list of more um, esoteric things that you can see here. So again, getting back to the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, this is an important part of the differential diagnosis, and especially when you're taking the history of the alcohol to say, well, you know, yeah, I just have two drinks a day, it's very important to quantitate that drink. <laughs> because everybody has a different definition of that, especially up in Minnesota. Um, so looking at uh, steatosis by ultrasound, so if you just take the control population, 16% um, will be diagnosed with, um, with steatosis. People with heavy use of alcohol, nearly half. People who are obese, again, similar, two-thirds, or, or a little bit over in this particular study. But if you combine obesity with heavy alcohol use, it's basically 100%. So the other NASH, non-abstinent steatohepatitis, again, this is a tricky thing to tease out sometimes, and many patients can actually have both, and need both problems addressed. Um, so mechanisms of susceptibility to NASH. So again, understanding those five hits and how they line up. It's, um, patients uh, can have the progressive fibrosis from these other factors um, playing into it. So the endocrine causes Interesting, uh, panhypopituitarism is strongly associated with fatty liver disease, even in patients who are not obese. Um, looking at patients who um, came and had, uh, this is at Mayo actually, 10 patients with biopsies and um, you know, a, a big cohort, 30% of the total had cirrhosis. Um, we have transplanted three patients with panhypopituitarism for NASH, and they had very aggressive and rapid recurrence. So this is a part of the differential diagnosis, if it's not fitting together, to understand that sometimes this can be connected, patients who didn't even know that they had this uh, condition. 
Also, certain genetic risks, this uh, PNPLA3, which is a genetic uh, link that has been identified as increasing your susceptibility to NAFLD. Um, so this actually is something we can test for both in donors and in recipients, um, and we can know that. So it's a factor in liver disease um, and actually in liver transplant. Um, this is probably one of the more interesting findings. Um, this is also work from Mayo, but um, and this is a rat study, so maybe not directly applying to humans, but um, when they fed the rat standard chow versus a high-fat diet versus a this is a fast food diet here, so very high in cholesterol and saturated trans fat, fatty acids, and this seemed to be the most strongly inducing of both steatohepatitis and fibrosis. So not simply the high fat diet, but the fast food diet with the trans fats uh, in particular. So this seems to be very strongly um, inducing of steatohepatitis. So probably, as we mentioned, um, a uh, very multifactorial thing. So what does it really mean, NASH and NAFLD? What, what will be the long term? So if you compare the sort of expected survival to the observed survival in the general population with NAFLD and NASH, they are not going to have as good of survival. This is a, over time here in the um, x-axis is in years. It will have an impact in their long-term survival. But surprisingly, it's not usually from liver. So liver is a cause of death for patients with NASH or NAFL, but certainly much more commonly it's obesity-related malignancies and heart disease or ischemic heart disease is the vast majority. So most patients with NASH do not die of liver disease, but rather of other obesity-related conditions, primarily heart and malignancy, but still liver is important. But the implications of fatty liver disease are very important. It may be that there's really no sort of benign fat in the liver because of these associations that I just showed you with the increased risk of heart disease and cancer. So the metabolic syndrome, the NAFLD and NASH, and cardiovascular disease are definitely connected. And this has an impact not only for the general population who's obese, but also for the liver transplant population, which is, of course, the group of patients that I care for uh, most directly. Um, and of course, if you have a transplant, then you need to take anti-rejection medications, which Unfortunately, also increase your risk of metabolic syndrome because they cause hypertension, diabetes, um, and perhaps also obesity. So this is a problem, actually. Um, so in terms of treatment or addressing, you know, the metabolic syndrome, I'm a transplant surgeon. I'm not the person to talk to you about this, but um, just to let you know, the general approach optimizing the treatment of the metabolic syndrome is basically treat them as it would normally be indicated. Um, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, do potentially reduce steatosis, inflammation. You don't use these drugs specifically to treat this condition, but often you're treating the metabolic syndrome. Their hypertension is part of that uh, condition. Fish oil potentially uh, has a role. Um, if the patient needs it anyway, that's even more uh, of a benefit. Um, other things, again, this is definitely not in my area of um, expertise, but Things that have been suggested are things that may be coming in the future, a beta cholic acid. This is just finishing phase three trials, potentially showing um, decrease in the activity. So this is what this NAS score means, basically looking at the biopsy and less activity. Fish oil, again, uh, caffeine potentially has a ch chance to reduce fibrosis progression. Um, this is a report that certainly needs a lot more data. Uh, use of probiotics or prebiotics, very small randomized control trials potentially showing improvement in liver enzymes. So maybe a lot of things in the future, nothing that would be standard of care at this time. So how does that relate to transplant? Any discussion about liver transplant and liver disease, um, you need to understand a little bit of background about transplant. So I'm just going to give you that right now. Um, when we start talking about transplant, the most important thing to understand is that even though there's lots of patients waiting um, in the United States, about 16,000 people who need a liver transplant, we were only able to transplant about 6,000 of those people. So we have an extreme shortage of organs. Therefore, it's really important for us to select the optimal recipient because we don't have enough. So we have to give it to the person that needs it the most as well as who is going to benefit from the transplant. And that is sometimes difficult. Um, and this is obviously even more true for kidney, where there's 100,000 people waiting, a similar heart and lung, very 
extreme shortage of organ transplants. So if we could just transplant everybody that needed it, we wouldn't have to be so worried about, you know, are they going to have a great benefit from this or not. Um, you know, if we can't get a five-year survival, it's hard to justify giving people a transplant, uh, especially when you consider what happens to people when they're put on the list. So this just shows you exactly that. This shows people who have been put on the liver transplant list starting in 2008, following them over the next three years, what happened to them. And you can see in these colors here, this top group here, which is these two colors on the top, sort of green colors, um, they either were removed because they were too sick or because they died. And that's nearly 25% of the patients. A small little sliver here transplanted with a living donor, another bigger group, um, you know, probably 45% transplanted with a deceased donor, and then another group, you know, about 20% who are still waiting. So that context is important to consider, that basically about 13% of the list dies every year. How are livers allocated? Again, this might be something that most of you know, or maybe none of you know, but um, the current strategy, because as I mentioned, we do have an extreme shortage, the strategy is based on this idea of urgency. So the most sick patient has the access to transplant first. So previous to February of 2002, we primarily did it on waiting time. All these other things were part of it, but at the end of the day, everybody had the same status and it defaulted to waiting time which really doesn't work very well for liver transplant. So the current policy really in place for more than a decade is based on the probability of death. Well, how do we know who that's going to be? Well, that's what the MELD score does. Um, that's a very complicated formula that you can see there, but it relies on three tests that are very easy to get, creatinine, bilirubin, INR, very easy, reliably reproduced in all different labs. And this score is very good at saying who's going to be dead or alive in the next three months as a result of their liver disease. It's not um, very good to say who's going to, you know, fall and hit their head or get, you know, hit by a bus, but it's very good at saying who will be dead or alive as a result of the function of their liver on this given day. And it's really predictive of weightless mortality at three months. So that's how the patients are prioritized on the liver transplant waitlist. And this is a formula that you can go and just calculate it. You don't have to memorize that score. So patients actually monitor their own score and they can see where they are at any given time. Um, so that's kind of a bit about the wait list. Importantly, how does that relate to obesity? What you can see here is that over, similar to the data that I showed you with the rising, rising incidence of obesity, we have a rising incidence of obesity-related liver transplants. So you can see NASH is rising. And if you add in what we call cryptogenic or CC, because a lot of times when we didn't know the diagnosis, we called it cryptogenic. In reality, most of the cryptogenic patients that we were transplanting were obesity-related liver disease. We just didn't recognize it, so we called it cryptogenic. So if you add half of those that we considered to be cryptogenic to the NASH, you know, it's nearly 15% of the patients we're transplanting. And you can see that it was like 2% before. So it's really the only indication that is rising. And hepatitis C is actually coming down, still very much strongly the most common indication. But it is projected over the next decade that we're going to cross, that NASH will cross over hepatitis C as the most common indication for liver transplant. So similar data shown from UCLA, which is a very large transplant program, um, they reported uh, just a year and a half ago on their experience. And again, they were able to demonstrate this sort of flat and then really dramatic rise in the incidence of transplant for NASH. So this one right here is the NASH. And again, hepatitis C coming down to, um, you know, from 45 down to 30%, and then the NASH getting up to 20%. So their second most common uh, indication for transplant. So what will that mean for outcome? So the SRTR is a large mandatory data reporting system that all transplant programs are required to participate in. It's audited, um, so we know that the data is valid. And this is where we do find out a lot about what kind of things happen in transplant in the United States. So they looked at SRTR data from this cohort, which is a 20, um, no, more than 20 years, a 30-year cohort. And you can see that patients on the extremes of the BMI did not do as well as those in the normal range. Again, normal is kind of loosely defined here, 18.5 up to 40. So these were extremely obese patients over 40, but even worse than that were the very malnourished patients, both of which did worse over time. However, one of the criticisms of this series was there was no correction for ascites because obviously if a patient has 10 or 15 kilos of um, 
ascites, it's hard to know what their real BMI is. The anasarca, which is extreme fluid overload, is also a problem for patients with liver disease, so it can really um, skew the BMI and make this data more difficult to interpret. Additionally, there was a very small number in each of these extreme groups with the vast majority of the patients in this middle group. So only 1,400 patients with a BMI over 40 compared to 68,000 in that middle group, so that's quite a difference, actually. Um, we looked at a different data set, the NIDDK data set, which is uh, another data set consisting of five transplant programs. Um, in this data set, we were able to correct for ascites. And when we did that, um, we saw actually that the outcomes were very similar. So these are showing the different classes of obesity with normal being right here in the sort of gray and then overweight being black and then the checkered. And you can see actually there was really no difference in outcomes percent who died depending on the weight with the exception of the underweight group doing the worst. So there was an increasing, uh, in, which was independently associated increased risk of death for each leader of ascites, but in the absence of ascites, there was no change. Um, so it's really important to make sure that any kind of studies on obesity are interpreted in the context of uh, volume of ascites. Um, the UCLA, same paper that I showed you earlier, also reported on their long-term outcomes. And really what they found is patients who were heavy with a BMI greater than 35 had very similar outcomes to those with a normal BMI, with one exception, those that had a diagnosis of NASH and a big BMI, they didn't do as well. But other patients with a large BMI who did not have NASH, because you don't have to have NASH uh, to be um, obese, you can have alcohol, as we said, or hepatitis C. Um, so there was no difference there. And a more recent paper, this is from 2012, it's a different cohort of patients, 2004 to 2011, again, using the SRTR data. This time they selected an even more different cohort, so less than 18.5, 18.5 up to 45, and then greater than 45. Again, the underweight patients did worse, but the heavy patients were the same. So it's hard to know. It seems that if you select the patients properly, they may do okay, but that's in you know, sort of medium term. If you look at the long-term outcomes, again, now this is the NIDDK, um, which is an NIH-funded multi-center trial, looking at those patients over the long term, why did they die after their transplant? The long-term causes of mortality, well, there's a chunk of them that got recurrent liver disease, hepatitis C would be the most common, but a bigger proportion who died of non-hepatic causes. And of those, you can see cardiovascular and malignancy, even on renal, are associated with obesity. Um, and the long-term risks of mortality were age, of course, uh, and diabetes and renal insufficiency. Diabetes clearly being linked to obesity, potentially also some issue with obesity and renal insufficiency. What about recurrence of NASH? So if you do a transplant for NASH, is it gonna come back? Well, yes, it is. Um, recurrent steatosis, so not steatohepatitis, but just the bland steatosis is common and it usually comes back within a year. However, it's good to know that progression to advanced fibrosis is rare. So this is just a series of different biopsies, um, or different papers that reported on biopsy findings, pretty small numbers here in most all of them. Um, and again, you can see you know, a number of patients with recurrent NASH, but again, very rare to have cirrhosis. Um, this is a large biopsy series from Baylor trying to answer the same exact question, not as many patients, but it's a single center, 256 patients transplanted from this time. Um, and what they found was if you had a diagnosis of cryptogenic uh, or NASH or other, um, whether you're free of steatosis was much more likely if you did not have NASH or cryptogenic. So these people were much more likely to have steatosis but um, their outcomes, again, were the same. So similar fibrosis, similar cirrhosis, and identical patient and graft survival despite having fat in the liver. So it seems to come back, doesn't seem to cause as much problems as some other things like hepatitis C, at least specifically. And again, another large series, this is from 2012, looking at all the different diagnoses and outcomes 1997 to 2010, PSC with the very best outcomes, you know, nearly 80% of the patients alive at 10 years from transplant. Everything else is quite similar. The orange one in the middle is NASH. So a little bit less well than alcohol, but better than hepatitis C and better than HCC.
So to summarize this section of the talk, obesity and liver disease, NAFLD is currently the most common liver disease, and it is a rapidly rising indication for liver transplant. The short and long-term outcomes for obese patients who undergo liver transplant appear to be acceptable, but again, this is important to recognize that these are very selected patients. Um, the long-term mortality post-liver transplant is certainly impacted by obesity-related complications, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, renal disease. So what would be things to think about options for treatment? Um, this is uh, the various types of bariatric surgery. Um, right now, the standard, I would say the gold standard bariatric operation in the United States, at least, is a Rui gastric bypass, which is shown here. When it's becoming increasingly used is the sleeve gastrectomy, which is here where we remove the greater curve of the stomach and just make the stomach into a little tube or a little sleeve. The lap band is also popular. I would say it's becoming less popular because it doesn't really work that well. Um, and this is the duodenal switch. This is a kind of a more aggressive surgery. This um, sleeve gastrectomy actually is the, oftentimes the first stage of this. And when they found that this in and by itself worked pretty well, you didn't have to go back and do this fancy thing, um, patients just started having the sleeve gastrectomy. Both B and C are done laparoscopically very commonly. A is also done laparoscopically. The switch could be done laparoscopically, but again, it's not a very common operation. It's often for the very super obese. So can you ever think about bariatric surgery prior to transplant? Well, it's been reported, a very small series. This is six patients who had a sleeve gastrectomy, patients who had really much at all that you would consider decompensation, meaning symptoms of their liver disease were excluded. So if they had hepatic encephalopathy or varices that were two or higher, they were excluded. If they had ascites, they were excluded. So this is basically all the patients on the liver transplant list because you wouldn't be on the list if you didn't have any of these symptoms. Um, the BMI was greater than 40, and in this small series of six patients, the liver did remain stable, the metabolic syndrome improved, and they did have very good weight loss. They had several patients that had some issues, one that had to be admitted for encephalopathy, two with ascites, um, and one that had bleeding and required reoperation. Um, this is another uh, series, this is quite a bit older, and they had only 30 patients out of 2,000 that were undergoing a lap Rui gastric bypass, and they said they had cirrhosis, but they didn't do a biopsy. They just it was a visual inspection, so this is a little suspicious. But in this series of 30 patients, they had no deaths. Um, they were able to conclude that it was possible in child's A if you used a laparoscopic approach, but I think there was not a lot of detail in this study. This is a more recent um, paper from 2011, and this um, was using the national inpatient sample data set. And they found very large numbers of patients who were having bariatric surgery. If they had no cirrhosis compared to compensated cirrhosis, 3,000 patients, their odds ratio of death was, you know, double. And if they had decompensated cirrhosis, you know, their odds ratio was 21. So certainly not indicated for the 42% perioperative mortality in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. So anybody that you're considering referring for liver transplant or bariatric surgery, I would go down the liver transplant pathway <laughs> because you really can't operate on people with decompensated cirrhosis. Not really any kind of surgery is advised except emergency surgery. So um, another interesting thing, we have admitted several patients who actually got liver failure post weight loss operation. This has been reported. We've taken care of several patients that have this, and it's probably multifactorial. They probably already had underlying fatty liver disease that was not diagnosed, but um, potentially with significant weight loss, mobilization of free fatty acids, then they can develop subacute hepatic failure. Um, in this paper, there's this pretty small series, but we have also cared for patients with this, and the main treatment is nutrition. In this group, um, they didn't do well. Uh, in our patients, we've not had to transplant any of them, um, but it's a condition that you want to be aware of. Um, in terms of liver transplant, uh, or after liver transplant, thinking about bariatric surgery, um, this has also been done. So again, a series, a bunch of small series. This is 2001. They did two patients with a Rui gastric bypass. They thought it worked out okay, but it was technically demanding. In 2005, again, um, one patient in this series, they had resolution of the metabolic syndrome, but it was technically demanding. 2007, they had an open sleeve combined with a revision of the bile duct, and this patient lost weight very well. So three 
individual little case reports. This is a much, you know, not much larger, but now we have nine patients um, in this series, and this is laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, post-liver transplant. Three patients had to have a reoperation in the first 90 days, so a third of the patients had to have a reoperation, but otherwise um, looks like very good um, weight loss and stable graft function, hospital stay not unreasonable. Short follow-up, only six-month follow-up. More recent series, seven patients. This is from the University of Minnesota after their liver transplant had open Rui gastric bypass. Um, in this series, um, again, good weight loss, um, but the complication rate was high. Sorry, I should have. Um, in this uh, series, the complication rate was high. Um, and in fact, three patients had adverse outcomes. One, two died and one had to have it reversed. So maybe uh, a little bit concerning. This is a report, the first report of perioperative, meaning they did bariatric surgery at the same time as their liver transplant. And this patient had a combined gastric band. So that silastic band that you can put on was done at the same time as a transplant. The patient was actually having a retransplant um, and she had a short hospital stay. Follow-up was short, but had good weight loss and good resolution of the metabolic complications. Single case report, they hadn't provided any further follow-up. Um, how do we approach this in Rochester? This is uh, really, as we've demonstrated, a problem that is common for us now. We actually have always had dietitians on the liver transplant service, but the majority of their career has been focused on the malnourished patient because we all think of patients with cirrhosis, severe muscle wasting, you know, ascites, weight loss, we've got to get them to eat. But in fact, more than a third of our list is now with obesity, just exactly like the whole population. So we decided to have a structured approach. There's basically three ways you could do it. You could just say no to everybody who's obese. You could just say yes to everybody's obese and just transplant them and accept that they'll have, you know, worse sort of long-term issues related to worsening metabolic syndrome. And, or you can try a structured approach and get patients to deal with it. So that's what we decided to do. And we really put it uh, in a similar way as we approach our patients with alcoholic liver disease. They have a very structured approach. They're asked to do this kind of treatment, this, this, and this. We try to come up with a similar thing for our obese patients. Um, so we gave them a specific goal. We'd like everyone to get under a BMI of 35 for transplant. So if they're over 35, they get enrolled in the obesity management protocol. Um, they are asked to follow a calorie-restricted diet. We spend a lot of time on instructing them on how to do that. They can either use Weight Watchers, you know, some patients count calories on their own. Some use liquid meal replacement. Um, they keep a record. They weigh, and then we give them pedometer and other things, targeting their activity to what they can do. Obviously, patients have different activity restrictions, so we just assess what each patient can do. And then we follow them. So every time they can, because patients with advanced liver disease continue to come back for follow-up because they have to wait for their transplant, and they have to keep coming back. And every time they come back, they see the nutritionist and myself usually. So we have a lot of opportunity to continue to work on this. Um, and basically, um, it doesn't work, or we really can't offer it to someone who's hospitalized with severe decompensation. Um, but we've found that it is effective in lower male patients, especially patients with HCC who are doing OK, who are waiting. And about 70% of our patients are able to achieve that weight loss target, partly because they're motivated, partly because we have good, I think, um, continued follow-up and continued to readjust the targets for them. But what we also found was that not everybody could make it to that. And so what we decided to try was the sleeve gastrectomy with the liver transplant. And we reported this last year in the American Journal of Transplantation, um, combining a liver transplant with a sleeve gastrectomy for the patients who were enrolled in the obesity protocol but did not make their goal. Um, the reason we chose the sleeve gastrectomy is that it does not have malabsorption, unlike the RUY, which is both restrictive and malabsorptive. The reason that the sleeve gastrectomy works is it just restricts the amount of food patients can eat, but there's no malabsorption. So, that's um, an advantage when you're trying to get patients on anti-rejection medicine. We don't have to deal with any kind of changes to the medicines. It's slower weight loss than the Rui gastric bypass, which we also think is favorable, and it's technically more straightforward. Um, the other advantage is we don't lose access to the first part of the small intestine. So right here is where the bile duct would come in, and if we had to do any kind of bile duct um, work with the ERCP, we can still easily get the scope there. So those are all the reasons we chose this operation. Um, this is actually the first patient that we did it in, um, a guy that we had followed for a 
three years in the obesity protocol, he could never make any progress, so he got that surgery. This is just what the surgery looks like, the little sleeve um, staple line you can see right there. Um, so this just compares, we had 37 patients in the non-invasive approach who had actually come to transplant. We have more than 100 that we've put into the protocol, but you know some patients are just stable and still you know, waiting. Um, and we had seven at the time of this report who'd had the sleeve. We've now done 13 total, but um, at the time of this report, we had seven. Um, the mild at transplant for the non-invasive protocol was quite a bit lower. So these um, patients in the non-invasive arm were less sick, as I mentioned, 19, and this was 32. Um, and the mean BMI is also obviously different with the people that lost the weight because this is what we asked them to do to get under 35. There were 33 at transplant. These people were 48 as the mean BMI at the time of their transplant. So um, for the non-invasive patients, um, when they went into the protocol, their BMI was nearly 40. When they went to transplant, it was 33. Their mild is here. Their average weight loss is here. In this group, we had um, BMI at one year at 36. Um, so the, at the follow-up, importantly, 21 out of 37 have gained at least some weight, and unfortunately, 16 are now, again, considered obese, um, with five having a BMI of more than 40. So weight loss um, it was effective, but unfortunately not durable in some patients, although um, you know, half of them did maintain their weight loss, so that's, I guess, encouraging. Um, in terms of outcomes for the sleeve patients, the ones that had the combined liver transplant with the sleeve, we did have one devastating complication, which was a guy that had early dysfunction of his liver and a leak. He did recover, but it was a very long road for him. Um, he's doing just fine right now. The BMI for follow-up in these patients, you can see the range here. Um, and this is just additional follow-up. We've, as I mentioned, had 13, well, it's 13 as of today, because we just did one last night. Um, and we've had one patient who has significant weight gain at three years. So weight gain is also possible after a sleeve gastrectomy. Um, in this paper, nobody had post-transplant diabetes and you know, patients had pretty effective weight loss so far, but it can come back. And that's really the question with sleeve gastrectomy. Because it's not an operation we've been doing as long as the Rewi gastric bypass, and it may be similar to other restrictive operations that we've done in the past, the long-term results may not be as good. It's hard to know, so we'll need to keep watching that. Um, so again, this is just a comparison of the weight loss. And getting back to our patient now, what to do with this particular patient, our guy that was referred to us from Kansas who was young and otherwise well, what to do. We had concerns about his size and also the fact that he had cell fulminant and hepatic failure, meaning he was already encephalopathic. We really had some concerns about whether we could fully assess him for the sleeve. Does he really know what he's signing up for? Because obviously it changes the way you eat for the rest of your life. In this particular situation, actually this patient's wife had already had sleeve gastrectomy, so they at least knew one half of the couple knew what was <laughs> coming. So we felt comfortable going ahead. Um, this is that patient who is obviously pretty large. Um, and he, we decided to go ahead. He's just done beautifully with the surgery. So that was how we approached that. Um, so in summary, pre-transplant obesity surgery is really an option only for very highly selected patients. Certainly high risk in anyone with, with decompensated cirrhosis should not be considered. Post-transplant obesity surgery, I would, follow, I would favor doing a lap sleeve, but there could be barriers. One of the most important barriers we've run into is insurance coverage. Not everybody has insurance coverage for weight loss surgery, unfortunately, um, and that's an issue. Um, the combined approach um, might be an option. I think the, our, our data is very preliminary so far, um, but you know I think it's possible. Um, the short-term outcomes that we can demonstrate is that the combined surgery is safe, um, and the weight loss seems to be successful, at least in the short term, and we have reduction in the metabolic complications, but what I don't know is whether it's gonna be durable. That's probably the biggest concern that I have. Um, so the key questions about that combined surgery, you know, why would you do it simultaneous? Why don't you just do it later at four months or a year? Well, the most important reason is nobody wants to have two operations. Um, other things that we've found really get in the way after having a transplant to prevent patients with recurrent obesity or refractory obesity from having weight loss surgery post-transplant, things like rejection that come up or infections, but most importantly, insurance coverage. Um, other things like getting back into the abdomen again, now it's all scarred and it's quite a bit more difficult um, to get in the second time, whereas when we're there, it's pretty easy to access. 
Why would you do a sleeve instead of a band or a rouai? Well, we don't like the band because of that foreign material that's in there. It can erode into the stomach. The sleeve is much less complex than the rouai. And of course, as I mentioned, we preserve access to the biliary tree, which is helpful. Probably most important of all is the more gradual weight loss that happens with the sleeve. So I think the ideal thing would be a randomized controlled trial where you do them together versus delayed to really answer this question. And we have a Mayo in Florida and Mayo in Arizona. So hopefully with these three sites, we may be able to perform that trial in the future. But anyway, that's what I have for you on obesity and liver disease and transplant. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this lecture. It was very enlightening. Um, I'm curious, is there anything in particular about the NASH patients where you would like the MELD score referral at a certain level versus other patients? Yeah, that's a great question is, you know, when to send the patient. And I think the short answer to that is no. I think when patients are showing decompensation, you should send them kind of regardless of what their MELD score is. Um, you know, we had a patient just this week. Her mouth scar had been 14. We've been following her, but she did have decompensation. She came in with this hideous infection. You know, her mouth score is 40 right now. And it's much easier that we already knew her. We've been following her for a long time in the obesity protocol, actually. Um, so I think whenever patients get decompensated, even if their score is 12 or 14, it's better to meet them now rather than having her come in with the mild of 40 on the ventilator and we've never met her. And it's much harder at that point in time. And, you know, she was relatively stable, but she just got SPP. So the NASH patients, we certainly have to pay more attention to their cardiovascular risk and make sure their heart's okay. They're much more likely to have concurrent heart disease than patients with other types of liver disease. But barring that, I think they're the same. And I think anybody that's having decompensation should come. Yes, could you um, say how you do the donor transplant and what the prognosis is for the donor? Are you talking about living donor liver transplant? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to speak about that. So living donor liver transplant is an option that we consider because of the information that I showed you earlier on the extreme shortage of available livers. Um, so the advantage of living donor transplant is that a patient can have access to timely transplant without continuing to suffer and actually have a risk of mortality on the wait list. And there has been clearly a survival advantage for people that are able to come to a transplant center and have a living donor transplant compared to coming to the transplant center and waiting or having a deceased donor transplant. So there is a benefit, but the big downside of living donor transplant is the risk to the donor. So instead of having one patient, we have two patients. Um, and if we could choose, we would not choose to do living donor transplant because I don't like having a healthy person at risk. The risk for the healthy person is that they could die or they could need a transplant. And looking at that the world experience and the U.S. experience, we generally would say that that risk is one in 300, that they could either need a transplant themselves or they could die. Um, and so that's what you have to consider. The other important thing for a donor is that it is a big, huge surgery that takes time to recover from. Um, they need to know that they're going to be off at least six weeks, depending on what kind of work they do, if they have a heavy job. You know, it's going to be longer, obviously. So we tell them to plan for three months off. Most people are back between six and eight weeks, but um, it's a big deal to take three months off of work. Assuming you've had some postmortems, what what does the liver look like uh, on these obese patients? That well, transplant? that's a great question. Um, the most common sort of postmortem is is really not a postmortem; it's a donor operation. So we go on organ recoveries for donors who are obese and sometimes the liver we can't take it because it's so fatty um, so it, it just a fatty liver is just it's large so it's bigger than it should be the edges are rounded it's very yellow um, and it it looks you know i don't know if you've ever seen foie gras but that goose liver when you feed the goose too much fat it's very much like that it's squishy it's not the same color it's not the same texture it's quite a bit larger kind of gross to think about it that way but um Mm -hmm. Oh, the livers we take out, the fatty livers. That's another good question. So does it look any different when you transplant a NASH patient compared to, say, an ASH patient, which is alcoholic steatohepatitis or hepatitis C? 
they don't really look any different. They're just kind of shriveled up and hard, and it's very, the explant findings are almost exactly the same. It's just cirrhosis. The only patients that usually have different looking livers are PSC and PBC. They're more green and they're a lot larger, but NASH and hepatitis C and alcohol, they all look about the same. So those are a lot of good questions. I'm glad you guys had uh, some questions. Thanks very much.